Okay, ten more, and we have our clan. Uh, just kidding. Uh, we're, 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 maybe we'll have one more. We'll see. But we're excited about being here. We actually were here just four and a half months ago, and uh, we ran the Yukon Do It Marathon, not far from here, December 30, right along the waterfront. It was absolutely beautiful. Just uh, stunning uh, scenery and friendly people, and so we're glad to be back here in a in a relaxed, non-exerting environment. I'm glad that I'm not sweating quite as much, uh, but uh, it really is good to be in, in Port Orchard, and you all have an absolutely beautiful location. Now, you may be wondering, all right, why am I here? Well, Revelation of Love is a Bible prophecy seminar, and that means, friends, that uh, really we're not interested in what I have to say. Because what I have to say is not nearly as important as what God has to say. Would you agree, friends? Amen. And so this right here is going to be our textbook. We want you to leave this seminar with a deeper understanding and knowledge of Scripture and a closer relationship with Jesus. And from time to time, I might even call you Bible students. Is that okay? We're Bible students here, and we're going to be learning about the Word of God. I want to tell you about uh, tomorrow night's presentation. It's called Perfect Prophetic Proof of Jesus Christ's Identity. And if you leave tonight thinking, you know, I might just have a little bit more trust in this book, then after tomorrow night, you're going to absolutely be leaving saying, you know what, this book I can trust. You will, you will not only have your mind blown tomorrow night, but also you will leave with your heart more in touch with the Savior Jesus. Come and hear the mathematical proof as we study Daniel chapter 9 that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Then on Monday night, powerful presentation called The Rock That Will Not Roll. We live in an era of uh, a, a time where, where really there's not a lot of stability. You look around us, you look at the news, and you say, you know what, is there anything that truly is something that I can trust? We're going to talk about that Monday night, the rock that will not roll, and a twin presentation. If you come Monday night, you have to come Tuesday night to hear a presentation entitled Revelation's Eternal Sign of Love. We're going to look at some powerful Bible promises. We're going to look at some Bible verses, some more prophecies in Daniel and Revelation, all of these different nights, and so make sure and you mark your calendars. Now, in the entrance of transparency, I just want to briefly tell you, uh, why are we doing these meetings? You may be coming in and I saying, hey, why put out all of this time and energy and resources? Well, the first reason is that we here at Revelation of Divine Love believe that we're living in strange and unusual times. But we're not the only ones with that sentiment. Uh, just a few months ago, back in February of this year, BBC came out with an article entitled, Are We on the Road to Civilization Collapse? The author actually studies the demise of historic civilizations, and he's come to the conclusion that the signs of civilization collapse today are getting worse and worse. But you don't have to be a historian or a scientist to realize that we're living in strange and unusual times. In fact, there's almost a palpable tension in our world today. And so the second reason why we're holding these meetings is that tension that we're experiencing we realize that that tension is actually affecting people's mental health and their everyday life. Uh, the Pew Research Center came out with a report not too long ago, just a few months ago, and I know that's hard to see, but there on the top, they did a survey among uh, teenagers ages 13 to 17, and they found that among those surveyed, 70% of the teenagers surveyed said that anxiety and depression was a major concern among their friends. And you can read it in the news. We're experiencing a mental health crisis here in America right now, but it's not just teenagers. In fact, the American Psychiatric Association, they recently released a report, and in 2017, 19% of Americans reported anxiety. That number has basically doubled to today. 39% of Americans are feeling anxious. And maybe you came in tonight with a little bit of anxiety. What do we do in the face of this, this, these, really these bleak conditions of our world? Where do we go? 
Well, the third reason that we're holding these meetings is we believe, friends, that the answer to the mental health crisis, the answer to the issues that we are facing today is none other than a revelation of divine love. And that revelation of divine love is found in this book right here, the Bible. One of the best places that we can understand and grasp the concepts of this revelation of divine love is, is this incredible, remarkable, trustworthy book, the Bible. And friends, as I've said before, I'll say it again many times, we're not interested in what I have to say. You can fact check me all night long. And please come and tell me. Say, you know what? That was not in the Bible. We're interested not in what I have to say, but in what the Bible has to say. And I promise you that I'll uplift Scripture and I'll uplift Jesus. And so, that's the reason why we're holding these meetings, but you may be saying, well, why am I here? I saw that flyer. I came in. Maybe a little curiosity. Well, I promise you that, number one, you can expect reliable facts. All right? Sometimes we, we, we live in a world of, of YouTube and Google, and we're going to leave that speculation to the internet. We're going to have this reliable book right here, the Bible. You're going to, you can expect a progressive understanding. Each night will build on each other. You don't want to miss tomorrow night. And then you don't want to miss Monday night. The themes in each of these topics build on the last. We're going to talk about some learning resources that you can expect in just a minute. And friends, I think, and I don't just think, I know, that when we study the Word of God, the Holy Spirit shows up. And I think that there is going to be personal transformation. I know that God is going to do awesome things in your lives. So what are some of those personal resources that we want to offer you? Well, one of those resources is, is, is actually already in your pew. If you look in the pew in front of you, you'll see a Bible. Most of the verses that we're going to have are, are, are going to be on the screen, just uh, for the sake of time. But we encourage you to get out that Bible in front of you, to pull it out, and if you can, keep up. We're going to be going quickly. Uh, but, but to look up the Bible passages, and in that, in that pew in front of you is a, is a Bible called the Andrews Study Bible. Uh, one of the most famous study Bibles there is, one that is, is, is incredibly deep, and I think you'll enjoy it. Well, you know what? That, that Bible, you can use night after night, and if you show up 10 nights, friends, they'll mark you at registration, and you come 10 nights to Revelation of Divine Love, you can keep that Andrews Study Bible. We will give you the Andrews Study Bible, a new Andrews Study Bible, not just the one there in the pew. If you come 10 nights in a row, how many of you would like to do that? Amen. We'll give you that Andrews Study Bible. Well, the other resource is we're, as I mentioned, essentially holding a Bible school here. You are all Bible students. And at the end of every seminar, at, at, at the end of each night, you're going to exit the doors and you're going to receive uh, a guide. You're going to receive a Bible study guide that goes over the same topic that we studied that night. You might even receive two. And inside are similar Bible verses and, and concepts and thoughts. And what we're asking you is to go home, to go through that study guide on your own, and to fill out the answers. There's some fill in the blanks. And if you fill out every single one of these study guides, then you will receive a certificate of completion of our Revelation of Divine Love Bible School. We will celebrate you completing this Bible study. A graduation, we could say. Well, tonight's presentation is entitled, Prophecy's Final Countdown. I am excited about tonight's presentation. And as we will do each evening, before we begin, we want to bow our heads in, 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 in submission to the God of the universe. Because, friends, it doesn't matter about my education or my background or my experience. What matters is if you all and myself submit ourselves to the one who wrote this book. So as I bow my knee, will you bow your head and hearts in prayer? Father, we have come tonight to open up this special book. And Father, as we read your word, may your word read us. Father, I pray that you would open up in our minds and hearts, a deeper revelation of your divine love. 
And we pray and ask these things in your name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. This right here is my eldest son, Judah. He is three years old. He is currently in bed or close to getting in bed. And here he is in front of a bookstore. And can anyone tell me, friends, what is that book that he is holding? Can you see that? It's kind of hard to see. Children's Bible. This was Judah's very first full-length Bible that he purchased with his own money that he got from Christmas. Now, as a three-year-old, I admit, he received a little prompting from mommy and daddy. Judah, wouldn't it be so cool to buy your own Bible? Yeah, yeah, that would be an exciting day. And we went down to the bookstore, and he got this Bible. Now, I have a question, friends. Why would his parents want him, a three-year-old who cannot read, to have a full-length Bible? He can't even read that thing yet. But that's his Bible. It's not mine. It's not his mom's. It's his. The reason why, friends, is because we want our son from the earliest age to be excited about this book. We want him to come home saying, wow, I want to learn more about this book. Because this book is not only remarkable, but incredibly reliable and trustworthy. And I want to show you tonight why this book is reliable and trustworthy. First of all, the Bible is historically consistent. The dates, the uh, players in history, the kings, the nations, the things that you read in history textbooks that you Google online are found in this book. This book is historically consistent. In fact, historians tell us that if you look at ancient manuscripts, that the shorter the time gap between the earliest copy and between the original work, the more reliable the document. Let, let me explain. So you have here a number of ancient manuscripts, and we'll start at the top, Homer's Iliad. Have you heard of Iliad before? Homer's Iliad. Well, there are 500 years between the time that Homer originally wrote Iliad and between the earliest copy that historians have found. 500 years. But historians count Homer's Iliad as incredibly reliable. Well, Imperial Rome, another history book. There's 700 years between when Tatticus wrote that book and the earliest copy. Josephus' Jewish War, there's 800 years between the time that he wrote it and the earliest copy. Caesar's Gallic Wars, there's 1,000 years between when he wrote that and between the earliest copy. But friends, when you compare that to the New Testament, between when the New Testament was written and the earliest found ancient manuscript complete of the New Testament, there is only 90 years. Do you see the difference, friends? The shorter the time gap between the earliest copy and the original work, historians will tell you, the more reliable the ancient manuscript. And I want to submit to you tonight that this book is a reliable manuscript. In fact, F.F. F. Bruce, in his book, The New Testament Documents, writes, there's no body of ancient literature in the world which enjoys such a wealth of good textual attestation as the New Testament. No body of ancient literature in the world. And notice this, friends. If you look at the, it's simply the number of manuscripts that have been found. Just the, the number of ancient manuscripts that, that historians have in their possession. You can see the, the, the various works and the amount of manuscript copies there are. And notice, almost ten times more than all of those combined is the New Testament. We have 24,000 ancient manuscripts of the New Testament. Is that, a lot of, is that a lot of ancient manuscripts, friends? Absolutely. And one might think, one might think that with all those, those copies, I mean, there's bound to be some, some mistakes, right? But between all 24,000 of those copies, there's bound to be mistakes. But, friends, let me tell you that the Bible is translationally consistent. Before Facebook, before the Internet, before Google, 
Here is this book that has been translated faithfully through the centuries. And in fact, between all 24,000 manuscripts, these scholars write the New Testament has not only survived in more manuscripts than any other book from antiquity, but it has survived in a pure form than any other great book. And I love this last part. This blew me away. Between all 24,000 ancient manuscripts of the New Testament, there is a 99.5% purity between them all. In other words, in other words, they are all the same. There might be a minor difference here. There may be one word here or there that, that wasn't translated through the centuries. Friends, is that remarkable? Is it just me? Wow, incredible what we find here in the Bible. The Bible is not only translationally consistent, but also archaeologically consistent. Two quick examples. Uh, in the Bible, you find a group of people called the Hittites. You can see the different Bible verses where they show up in the Old Testament. And for many years, scholars and, and critics said, you know what? The Hittites don't exist. We can't find them in history until the late 1800s, early 1900s. They were discovered in Turkey. Their, 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 their palaces and their records were discovered in person through archaeology. Another example, King Sargon, you'll find in Isaiah chapter 20, verse 1. For many years, critics, scholars, skeptics said, you know what, Sargon doesn't exist. The Bible is a myth. Until the palace of Sargon was discovered in Iraq. Time and time again, Archaeology confirms what's found in the Bible. In fact, I love this quote. Nelson Gluack in his book, Rivers in the Desert, says, it may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. You find something in archaeology, it is going to confirm what is in Scripture because we can trust this book. The Bible is also internally consistent. It's amazing to me that, that this book, 66 books of the Bible, 40 different authors written over a time period of 1,600 years. And how in the world do they talk about the same thing? If you were to take a whole bunch of people and let's say write about food. How many of you like food? Yeah? Everyone likes food. And you took those authors and they said, you know, we're going to talk about spaghetti. And over a 1,600 year time span. And every single of these authors, you know what? They need to talk about spaghetti. All right? And there are 66 books about spaghetti. And there are 40 authors. And they went back uh, 1,600 years talking about spaghetti. Friends, that book on spaghetti would be the most random book you've ever read. All right? The, the, clearly, throughout that book about spaghetti, there wouldn't be a consistency in the book. How is it that this book, written over this time span, is so consistent. Only a supernatural book can do that, friends. The Bible is not only uh, internally consistent, but also culturally consistent. We have people from many different places here tonight. And how is it that wherever you are at in the world, the Bible can speak to you? The Bible is culturally consistent. The Bible is also experientially consistent. You like those emojis up there, right? We live in the 21st century. Is that okay? And I'm actually going to refer to those here, right? So, the Bible I have found to be the voice of God to my own soul. And friends, when I am happy, the Bible can speak to me, and it has. The times where I have been angry, and yes, I admit, there's been time to time I've been upset. God can speak to me through Scripture. When I am sad, God can lift me up. When I do not know what to do, and yes, that's what that emoji is. <gasps> Surprise! I don't know what to do. The Bible can speak to my heart. But it's not just me, friends. It's not just me. There are other people that have had God speak to them through this word. I pastored for six years in Southern California, and one of the high school students, a young girl that attended our church, uh, had an English teacher, and his name was Mr. Fowler. And Mr. Fowler one day did something that discouraged this young high school student. She goes home, and she's upset about her English teacher, Mr. Fowler. And she goes home, and she talks to her parents, and her parents try to encourage her and say, you know, why don't you go upstairs and, and pray? She was a Christian. Pray and maybe read the Bible. So she did. She goes upstairs, this young high school student girl, goes upstairs. She gets on her knees. She's praying about the, her English teacher, how frustrated she is with Mr. Fowler. And she opens up the Word of God. And she opened up to Psalm 91, and as she's praying about her English teacher, Mr. Fowler, she, she flips open a Psalm 91 and her eyes immediately rest on verse 3. 
Psalm 91, verse 3. Surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. That's a true story. And that young girl said, she came away saying, God, you spoke to me. <laughs> Amen? That's a true story. That's supernatural. Only God can speak to us in that way. God encouraged her that he was going to deliver her from the snare of the fowler. Friends, we found that the Bible has historical consistency, translational consistency, archaeological consistency, internal consistency, cultural consistency, experiential consistency. But last and definitely not least and definitely not conclusively, what we're interested in tonight is that the Bible is prophetically consistent. What did I say, friends? Thank you. Prophetically consistent. That this book talks about and includes prophecy. Now you may ask yourself, well, what is prophecy? That's a good question. Those are two important questions. What is prophecy? And also, where can I find it? And if prophecy is so good, where can I find true, reliable prophecy? Well, Merriam-Webster has a simple definition. Prophecy is a prediction of something to come. We could say it in another way that it's a foretelling of something in the future. A prediction of what is to come. Well, what about the second question? Where do we find true, reliable prophecy? We have historians that tell us about the past. We have news anchors that tell us about the present. But what about the future? Who tells us about what's going to happen in the future? Well, you might say, well, the, the weather man, he tells us about the future. He can predict the weather maybe, maybe a month in advance. But can the weatherman predict the weather when you walk out your door a hundred years? And you may not be alive a hundred years from now. Maybe that's a bad example. But 50 years from now, can the weatherman say, you know what? This is going to be the weather. Uh, Probably not. Where do we find true, reliable prophecy? You know, let's say we went to the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress has a lot of books, 39 million catalog titles, and we put all of those books in two piles. Right? So all the books in the Library of Congress in two piles. One pile, we have the books that claim to be from God. And the other pile are books that don't claim to be from God. Two piles of books. One pile of books that claim to be from God. Two Uh, Books that don't claim to be for God. Obviously, the books that don't claim to be from God would be a lot bigger. The books that claim to be from God are a lot smaller. And if we looked at those books that claim to be from God, what makes the Bible different than the rest? What makes the Bible different than the rest? You see, friends... There have been some people in history that have tried to predict the future. Maybe you have heard about Nostradamus. Have you heard of him? He was a a French apothecary and predictionist who came up with some predictions. And he was right maybe 10, maybe 15% of the time. Not a lot. But friends, I I don't want someone who's right 10% of the time. I want someone who's right 100% of the time. Where can we find reliable, true prophecy? Well, if you took that pile of books that claim to be from God, what separates the Bible from among them? You can look at the writings of Confucius. You can look at the writings of Buddha. You can look at the writings of Muhammad. And what you will find in all of those books that claim to be from God is that there is no predictive prophecy in any of them. Now, why is that? Why is that, friends? Perhaps could it be because the author doesn't know the future. Friends, the Bible contains over 30% of it with prophecy. 30% of Bible prophecy. Wow. Friends, we want to look at Bible prophecy throughout this seminar. We want to see that Bible prophecy can indeed mark out this book as a reliable book. If you have your Bibles, turn with me and then to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, the words will also be on the screen. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And we're going to read the first few verses of this book. We're going to go ahead and get started here. If you're still turning, that's all right. Verse 1 says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, 
which God gave him to show his servants things which must take place in a long time in the future. Is that what it says? Shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. Verse 2, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. You know, from time to time in our prophecy seminar, I, I may pause, I may pause, and I may do something different. Can we take a, a brief pause real quick? Brother Mo, I'm going to ask you to give me just a regular mic. This one's kind of falling off my ear. Is that okay, friends? Can I do that? You know what? We're relaxed. We're friends. Are you our friends yet? All right. We're going we're gonna to just take this off because sometimes you have technical difficulties and the devil tries to stop you, but are we going to let him stop us? Absolutely not. We are going to keep on rolling and I'm just going to take this off and we'll try to figure out that another night. But that was causing us issues and uh, Brother Mo is going to... Uh, here we go. Thank you, Elwain. Awesome. How many of you were... Uh, can we hear me? Here we go, Mo. Is that on? There we go. All right. How many of you are blessed by Alwyn's music? Wasn't that a blessing? Alwyn, thank you so much for sharing. When I get to heaven, I'll finally be able to sing like you, all right? Maybe uh, not on planet Earth. Maybe just turn me up a little bit, Mo. There we go. Here we go. Verse 2. Let's read it again. Who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Then verse 3. Blessed is he who reads... And those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is where? Near. Interesting first three verses. Now I want to go back to that first verse. Does it say the revelation of St. John? Is that what it says? Does it say the revelation of beasts? No, there's beasts in Revelation. We're going to talk about them. John wrote the book of Revelation. We're going to talk about them. But it doesn't say that. It doesn't say the revelation of the end times, which that's what the book is about, the end times. It says a revelation of Jesus Christ. Friends, first and foremost, this book is about Jesus. And the very first key of Bible prophecy is that Jesus is the foundation and the focus. Keys are important. If you have the right key, you can unlock the right door. And with this key of Bible prophecy, we can unlock the mysteries of Daniel and of Revelation. The second key we're going to find in the last verse, verse 3, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy. That word hear can also be translated understand. So blessed are those who understand the words of this prophecy. But how do we understand this book? Revelation, in fact, has for many years been thought of as a closed book. You don't find many churches, you don't find many pastors talking about the book of Revelation. But here we are told in verse 3 that this book can be understood. This book can be understood not just by a pastor, not just by a master student. This book can be understood by you, friends. This book can be understood by everyone. Why? Because verse 3 tells us that we can understand the book of Revelation. And the first key is that Jesus is the focus. The second key is that the book of Revelation, notice here on the screen, rests upon the foundation of what? The Old Testament. History and imagery and prophecy. In fact, and this is absolutely fascinating to me, if you look at every single verse in the book of Revelation, 404 verses, over 70%, 278 of those verses are from, or at least have material containing the Old Testament. If you want to understand the book of Revelation, then you also need to understand the Old Testament. Perhaps we could, we could liken this to the Rosetta Stone. Have you heard of the Rosetta Stone? The Rosetta Stone was discovered in 1799 by a French general. And he saw it there in the sand, one of Napoleon's generals. And there on that stone was an inscription. And there were three different inscriptions. There were Egyptian hieroglyphics, another ancient Egyptian script, and below that was Greek. And up until this point, they had not been able to crack the code of Egyptian hieroglyphics. They would visit the pyramids and they would try to see what they meant, but no one really knew what hieroglyphics were. They couldn't crack the code until the Rosetta Stone. And as the known, 
which is the Greek, was side by side and compared with the unknown, ah, things began to become familiar and they were able to crack the, cro the code of Egyptian hieroglyphics. And in a sense, friends, in a sense, the Bible is like the Rosetta Stone. You have in Revelation a lot of symbols. You have beasts. You have different animals. You have different imagery that says, well, what is that? Right? You don't go walking down the street and see a dragon, right? That's not, I mean, my son Judah probably would like that. He actually came in here and he said, Dad, it's a dinosaur. I'm like, yeah, you know, it kind of looks like that. Right? You don't see these images all the time. And so these are symbols in the book of Revelation. And the Bible is like the Rosetta Stone in the sense that it's its own interpreter. The Bible is its own interpreter. Let me explain. Now, if you go to Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, you will find some language that's used. It says, it talks about the lamb that was slain. Now, if you have no, if you have no experience with the Bible, if you've never read the Bible before, you might think that Revelation is a book about livestock, right? It's about sheep. It's about, it's about lamb, the lamb that was slain. Wow, someone had, Mary had a little lamb, their, their little lamb died, right? You might think it's about livestock, but if you go to the Gospel of John, John chapter 1, verse 29, John the Baptist looks at Jesus and says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So who, friends, is the Lamb that was slain in Revelation? It's Jesus. The Lamb in Revelation refers to Jesus. An Old Testament uh, imagery taken from the sanctuary service, and here it's explained all the way in the book of Revelation. You just have to go back a few books even, not even to the Old Testament, to the Gospel of John to find out what that is. The Bible is its own interpreter. Well, we said that one of the books that Jesus wants us to understand is the book of Revelation. We read that. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Blessed is he who reads and understands the book of Revelation. But there's one more book that Jesus wants us to understand. If you go to Matthew 24, 15, it's there on the screen. It says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, it's a big word, we'll get to that later, spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Here's Jesus talking. You can see this picture here. He's talking to his disciples. And he's telling them, when you see this abomination of desolation, whatever that is, spoken of by which prophet? Daniel the prophet. Jesus expects that his disciples are familiar with the book of Daniel. He wants his followers to read the book of Daniel. Wow. Two books, Daniel and Revelation, that go hand in hand. Now, friends, at this point, you may be asking yourself, all right, what's the big deal? So God knows the future. He can pull a rabbit out of the hat. I mean, yeah, I know that about God. God knows the future. What's the whole purpose of this prophecy thing anyway? Well, just briefly, friends, I want to give you four purposes of Bible prophecy because this is not some intellectual exercise. This is not just to say, wow, look at that. The Bible predicts the future. That's neat. All right, we'll see you later. I'll go down to the store and grab my groceries now. This is not just an intellectual exercise. There's a reason behind Bible prophecy. The first reason is found in Isaiah chapter 46. And what two verses, friends? 9 and 10. It reads, For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. Friends, the first purpose of Bible prophecy is to set the God of the Bible apart from other gods. It is so that we can say the God of heaven is different than the other gods. The second purpose of Bible prophecy is found in John chapter 14, verse 29. It says, Now I have told you before it comes, so that when it does come to pass, you may believe. Jesus talking to his disciples, he says, I'm going to tell you things ahead of time, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you can say, oh, that's right. Jesus told us about that. You know what? Because he can predict the future, I'm going to believe in him. The second purpose of Bible prophecy is to essentially create belief in our hearts. The third purpose of Bible prophecy found in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. 
For the word of God is living and powerful, or living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. As I said in my prayer, friends, when we read the Bible, we want the Bible to read us. Sometimes when we read the word, God reveals our priorities and says, you know what, I want to shift those a little bit. So, friends, the third purpose of Bible prophecy is to reveal the thoughts and priorities of our hearts. The last purpose is found in 2 Peter 1.19. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a what place? Dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. The morning star, friends, is Jesus. And the fourth purpose of Bible prophecy is to introduce the hearer to Jesus and the heart's need of him. Bible prophecy has a purpose, and by God's grace, we are going to see those four purposes as we progress in this seminar. Now, what we are going to do tonight, friends, I am excited about. I really am. We are going to look at one of the most powerful Bible prophecies in all of Scripture. And that is found in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2. And I want to invite you, if you have those pew Bibles, you can go ahead and turn though there. The words will also be on the screen. Daniel chapter 2, it's in the Old Testament, about two-thirds of the way in. You can look in your index if you can't quite find it. Daniel chapter 2, or maybe you have a, a Bible on your phone. That works as well. Daniel chapter 2 is kind of like the master key to all Bible prophecy. If you understand tonight, if you grasp just a little bit of tonight's presentation and prophecy in Daniel 2, then you will be able to grasp the other truths that we find in Scripture. Daniel chapter 2. Where do we find ourselves in Daniel 2? We find ourselves smack dab in the ancient nation of Babylon. Babylon. Babylon, friends, is 60 miles south of modern-day Baghdad in Iraq. It was the preeminent city and kingdom in that time. In fact, Babylon was so massive, so huge, that you could race two or three chariots on the top of its walls. Its walls were thick, and the king who ruled this ancient city was none other than Nebuchadnezzar. Babylon was in power for 70 years, a long time in the ancient world, and Nebuchadnezzar ruled Babylon for 40 of those years. The Bible tells us that Nebuchadnezzar was an amazing general. He was a great historian, and Nebuchadnezzar was also an incredible builder. In fact, to this day, archaeologists still are finding bricks with the inscription of Nebuchadnezzar on it. Nebuchadnezzar existed in history. But why is the Bible concerned with this pagan ancient city? The reason, friends, is because Babylon came in and besieged Jerusalem. 605 B.C., Babylon came right in, and they took some of the members of Jerusalem, some of the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They marched them 800 miles across the desert and started training them in the culture and ways of the Babylonians. And one of those captives was none other than Daniel, young Daniel. Daniel was marched right across the desert, he started training himself in the Babylonian ways. They enrolled him essentially in Babylonian university. And the amazing thing is, is that Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that they rose to the top. The Bible says in Daniel 1.20 that in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them a couple times better than the rest. Is that what it says? Ten times better. Wow. He found them. Ten. He looked at Daniel and his friends and said, you know what? These clearly, these men right here, Daniel, these, these slaves from Jerusalem are better than all of the wise men in Babylon. Friends, that is absolutely incredible. Why did they stand out among the rest? Because God blessed them. Because they committed themselves to follow him. So Daniel chapter 2 verse 1, the very first verse tells us that good old King Nebuchadnezzar, 
Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. In the second year of his reign, he had dreams. His spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. Now, some of you may be thinking that that really describes you last night, right? You couldn't sleep. You had dreams. Well, this Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and he woke up in the morning thinking, that was really important. <laughs> Something about the dream that he had was striking. Something about that dream that he had was memorable, but he couldn't quite pin the details down. That's happened to me before. You can ask my wife that I have a lot of dreams, and I've had some strange dreams. But most of the time, I don't remember my dreams. I can't seem to remember. It gets foggy. And that's what happens to Nebuchadnezzar. He can't remember the details of his dream. Well, in the ancient culture especially, dreams were so important. And so what Nebuchadnezzar does is he goes and gets his wise men. He realizes that these wise men have some special connection with the supernatural. And he says, you know what? I need to get my wise men together, and I need to ask them some things. So this is what he asked them. Verse 5, Daniel chapter 2, The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, or the wise men, The word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me two things, the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. Man, Nebuchadnezzar seems like a nice guy, huh? Right? Wow! This guy is tough. He says to his wise men, you know what? If you don't let me know what this dream is and the interpretation, I am going to tear you to pieces. The consequence of not letting him know what that dream was and what it meant was basically death. Well, the wise men stumble back. They try to gain some time, right? If someone came up to you and said, you know what? I'm going to kill you unless you do this. You say, uh, just a second. Let me ask some more questions, right? And they try to stall, and they answer the king this in verse 10. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, King, king, there's not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. I, I mean, no great and powerful thing has, has asked us anything like that. And then notice verse 11 what they say. This is powerful, friends. The thing that the king asks is dif difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. They realize, friends, that what the king is asking can only be figured out by supernatural means. They recognize that what the king is asking is so difficult that from a human perspective, it's impossible. Maybe they could make up the interpretation. If King Nebuchadnezzar said, yeah, I had a dream last night, this is what happened, they could take a step back and say, well, let's make this up. Maybe that means that, and that means that. But they didn't even know the dream. They had nothing to work with. Zero foundation. And they're making stuff up from scratch. They say, you know what? This is impossible. Well, one of those wise men whose head was on the chopping block was Daniel. Was Daniel. The, the young captive Daniel who had risen to the top and become ten times more wiser than the other wise men. The king had said... All of the wise men in the kingdom, I'm going to kill all of you if you don't figure this out. Can you imagine getting a knock at your door late at night? Uh, yes, who is it? I'm here to kill you. Whoa, what? Why? What's going on? And he starts explaining, well, you haven't answered. I, I didn't even know about it, Daniel says. Give me some time. And Daniel asked the man, whoever came to his door, he says, you know what? Give me some time. And he goes to his companions, and he tells his three friends, you know what? This is what we need to do. Daniel told them, his three friends, to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning his mystery. In other words, Daniel said, guys, we need to pray. We need to drop to our knees, and we need to seek the God of heaven because we can't, we can't tell this king his dream. That's impossible. We don't want to be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Friends, prayer still works. God is still in the business of answering prayers. And friends, when we are at the end of our rope like Daniel was, when there is no earthly solution that we can think of, we can do like Daniel did. We can drop to our knees and say, God, I need your help. And God hears those prayers. 
He does. He hears every single time that you talk to him. He says, yes, my child. Yes, I am listening. Prayer still works. Prayer worked for Daniel after he prayed with his friends. Verse 19 says, then... Then is a chronological word. Daniel prayed. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Friends, Jesus says in the Gospels, ask, seek, and knock. Ask, seek, and knock, and the door will be open. God is a gentleman, and he will not force his way into your life. But if you ask him, friends, he will respond. He responds to Daniel. He reveals to him in a night vision uh, what's going to happen? And, and then Daniel goes into the king, and the king uh, asks Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar. His Babylonian name had been changed from Daniel to Belteshazzar. And he says, hey, I remember you. Yeah, Belteshazzar. Daniel, are you able to make known to me the dream that I've seen and its interpretation? And I love Daniel's answer. He basically says, no. No. No, I am not. No, wise man or enchanter or magician or astrologer can show to the king the mystery the king has asked. And if Daniel stopped right there, Nebuchadnezzar would have said, well, why are you wasting my time? I'm, I'm going to chop your head off like the rest of the guys. But Daniel continues, verse 27, he says, no, I can't, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. Notice those words in bold. It gives us a clue as to what this dream is about. Daniel tells King Nebuchadnezzar, this vision is about what kind of days? The latter days, the days in the future. Friends, this is a powerful moment to me. Here is Daniel, maybe 19 or 20 years old, and he's standing before the most powerful man in the entire then known world. King Nebuchadnezzar. And there this Hebrew captive is standing before him and King Nebuchadnezzar is listening to his every word. He has his attention. Friends, never forget this lesson. That if you will kneel in humility before God, you can stand with confidence before kings. That if you kneel in humility before God, you can stand in confidence before the most powerful person in the world. Because God is above them all. Here's Daniel about to explain this dream. And he says this. He says, to you, O king. There's, there's no maybe. There's no, yeah, this, no. He says, this is what happened. To you, O king, as you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be after this. And he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. Three different times in the last few verses, Daniel says, this dream is about the future. This dream is about the future. Oh, in case you didn't get it, the dream's about the future. Three different times. And so essentially, this dream is like a big timeline, a big span of history throughout the ages, starting in 600 BC down through eternity. We're going to find that tonight, friends. Well, let's find out what King Nebuchadnezzar dreamed. Verse 31. You saw, O king, and behold a great image. This image was mighty and of exceeding brightness stood before you and its appearance was frightening. And I can imagine King Nebuchadnezzar as he's listening to what Daniel's describing is saying, yes, yes, that's right. It's coming back to him. He's hearing the details of his dream and saying, yep, you know what, that's it. Verse 32, the head of its image was of fine gold, its chest and, and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze. It's coming back to Nebuchadnezzar now. Verse 33, he says, its legs were of iron and its feet partly of what two metals, friends? Partly of iron and partly of clay. Yes, 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 King Nebuchadnezzar says, that's it. That is my dream. And you can see it in his mind's eye as Daniel's describing it. I'm sure Nebuchadnezzar closes his eyes and he, he sees this great statue with a head of gold and chest and arms of silver and, and belly and thighs of bronze and legs of iron and, and feet of iron and clay. But that wasn't all the dream as he's explaining this dream. He, he tells him, verse 34, as you looked, as you looked, a stone, and notice this detail, was cut out by no human hand. This was not any ordinary stone. 
No, the stone that was cut out without human hands came and struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Wow. That big statue was completely torn to bits. Notice verse 35. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold, working at the feet, going back up, all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. And notice this detail, friends. The stone that struck the image became a what? A great mountain and filled the entire earth. Wow. That stone, friends, came right at the feet of the image. The stone didn't strike the head. It didn't strike the body. It didn't strike the legs. It struck the feet of the image. The image was completely torn to bits. And that rock became a great mountain in King Nebuchadnezzar's dream and filled the entire earth. Right after that, verse 36, Daniel says, this was the dream. And I love that. He doesn't say, I th I'm pretty sure this is it. And I'm like 50-50, right? Right, King Nebuchadnezzar? I mean, come on, give, give me some feedback here. Where am I at? No, he says, this was the dream. This is exactly what you dreamed. I want that type of confidence, don't you, friends? And we can have that type of confidence when we put our trust in Jesus. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. I'm sure the king is sitting there immediately says, yes, yes, that is definitely it. Friends, do you want to know the interpretation? What does this dream mean? What is the interpretation that God gives? Let's jump right in. Verse 37, you, O king, the king of kings. Nebuchadnezzar rubs his shoulders. Yes, yes, that's right. Okay. Tell me more, Daniel. To whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, and the might, and the glory. Yes, yes, tell me more. And into whose hand, verse 38, he has given. Wherever they dwell, the, the children of man, the beasts of the field, and, and the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all, you are the head of gold. Daniel does not beat around the bush. He gets straight to it. Nebuchadnezzar, you are the king of Babylon. You are the king of the greatest nation in the world. And you, your nation Babylon, is the head of gold. Friends, you can go to Christian bookstores today. And you can look at various interpretations of this dream and you will find people saying that the head of gold is this or that or, or Europe or, or this. Different things. And here, the Bible is its own interpreter. It tells us. Isn't that beautiful? The Bible tells us exactly who the head of gold is. It's Babylon. You, Nebuchadnezzar, the kingdom that you rule. You are the head of gold. Babylon represented by that head of gold, ruled from 605 to 539 B.C., close to 70 years. Babylon was an incredible city. In fact, uh, different historians who write about Babylon notice just the, the size of the city compared to other cities. In fact, we'll talk about Rome in a second, which was a stronger nation, but it was smaller than Babylon. Babylon was 10 miles around, which back then is a, is a lot. Athens, only four miles. On top of that, Herodotus, Greek historian, 450 BC, says in addition to its size, Babylon surpasses in splendor any city in the then known world. How many of you have heard of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon? One of the seven ancient wonders of the world found there in that ancient city. Babylon was an impressive city. And in fact, it is very fitting that God used gold to describe Babylon. Why do I say that? Because if you look there in, uh, in, in the history of Babylon and you think about like the Ishtar Gate, which is actually a house in a museum, uh, and if you look at the Temple of Marduk, you will find that there's a lot of gold in Babylon. In fact, this temple, this temple which is 300 feet high, was overlaid entirely with gold. Entirely with gold. Some 18 tons of gold. Wow. That's a lot of gold, friends. 
And the altar and throne, this is what blew my mind, were not just overlaid with gold. Yeah, we'll put a little bit on the outside. The altar and throne were made from 8.5 tons of solid gold. Nebuchadnezzar was rich. He had a lot of money friends. We're talking about millions and billions of dollars in our world today. But Nebuchadnezzar had it. And so what a fitting description that God says, you know what, I'm going to use that head of gold, the top metal in value, to describe Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was a great conqueror, a military leader, and he was obsessed with the idea of, of Babylon lasting forever. In fact, archaeologists have discovered this clay tablet. And I want to read this whole thing. The clay tablet says, O Babylon, the delight of mine eyes, the excellency of my kingdom, may it last forever. Can you see, maybe, maybe just a little bit of pride in Nebuchadnezzar, right? Just a little bit. He looks at his kingdom and says, Ah, yes, this is my kingdom. And so when Daniel tells them, you are the head of gold, he's thinking, yes, I am. Thank you very much. Yes, I am at the very top. Yes, my kingdom is great. May it last forever. So when King Nebuchadnezzar heard the next words, and remember, this was all quick after each other. We're not, he wasn't looking into each verse like we are. But the very next thing that Daniel says in verse 39, you can see it in your own Bibles, he says, but King Nebuchadnezzar, after you. Wait, what? My kingdom's not going to last forever. After you, Nebuchadnezzar, shall arise another kingdom. Wait, there's another kingdom that's going to come after me? You better believe it, another kingdom. But in fact, this kingdom is inferior to yours. Now Nebuchadnezzar's really reeling in his boots. Wait a second. Another kingdom's going to conquer mine, and it's inferior. It's smaller than me. You better believe it. You look in history. You can check this out on Google, friends. The, the Medes and the Persians came in and conquered Babylon. The Persian Empire, represented by the chest and arms of silver, lasted from 539 to 331 BC. And in fact, how they got into Babylon was fascinating. Remember I said there was a, a river conveniently that came right underneath Babylon. The walls were tall. The walls were thick. They had a, a huge army. There was no perceivable way to get into Babylon, but Cyrus the Great came up with a plan. Cyrus the Great came up with a plan. And friends, this was all God-ordained. God foretold this way far in advance. And there Cyrus the Great thinks, you know what? There's that river flowing right underneath Babylon. He goes upstream. He dams the river, diverts it into a field. That river diminishes and gets less and less. And suddenly you have a dry riverbed right underneath Babylon. And when the Babylonian leaders were having a huge party, they themselves were drunk, had no clue what was happening. Cyrus the Great marches right in and conquers that city that Nebuchadnezzar thought would last forever. And in fact, archaeologists have found the Cyrus Cylinder that tells all about the demise of Babylon. This is history, friends. And the Bible predicted it years before it happened. Years before it happened, God, as he looked down through the ages, said, you know what? I'm going to let my people know what's going to take place. But there was a third kingdom. Verse 39, Daniel tells him, you know what? There's a, a kingdom that will conquer you that's inferior to you, but there's a third kingdom, a third kingdom of bronze. Well, which kingdom, friends, succeeded the Medes and the Persians? You look in history, friends. I heard it out there in the audience. The Greek Empire, represented by the thighs of bronze, ruled from 331 to 168 B.C. In fact, one historian actually has called them the mighty brass-clad Greeks. There they came in with their brass armor, and they defeated the Medes and the Persians, led by the great general Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great. One of the, 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 the top generals in the entire world. By the age of 30, he had created one of the largest empires in 12 short years. In fact, Alexander the Great, when he reached the, the Khyber Pass, which would lead through the Himalayan mountains to go to India, there were no maps drawn for the territory. He was in uncharted grounds. And he goes through and conquers them all. 
He was uh, an incredible general. But sadly, friends, despite his military genius and his military strength leading the Greeks, he actually died of a drunken stupor. He could control armies, but he couldn't control himself. In the book History of Rome, book 3, chapter 10, it says on June 22, 168 B.C. at the Battle of Piedna, uh, perished the empire of Alexander the Great 144 years after his death. 168 B.C. History books will tell you, and the Bible told you before it even happened. But friends, there's one more kingdom. It says, The fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush the other metals. These legs of iron represented by Rome. 168 B.C. to 476 A.D., one of the longest-lasting nations. We've heard phrases like, all roads lead to Rome. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. Rome was a strong nation. Iron was a, was a fitting symbol to describe them as they came in crushing their enemies. Jesus was hung by Romans on a cross. He was watched by Roman soldiers in the tomb. And in fact, Edward Gibbon in his famous book, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, which, by the way, is from a completely secular perspective. He, in fact, Gibbons was known, he was known for being openly against organized religion. And notice what he says. From a non-religious perspective, as he's writing about the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, he says the images of gold, silver, or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successfully broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. Friends, where does he get that language? Where does Gibbons pick up that language? From the Bible. Wow. A secular historian who's saying, you know what? Maybe there's something to Scripture after all. So we have this statue, this, this great timeline of history. You have Babylon represented by the head of gold, and the Mede of Persia came in and conquered them. Then the brass-clad Greeks came in and conquered the Medes and the Persians, and the mighty iron-clad Romans came in and conquered Greece. Powerful, powerful, historical timeline that we find in the Bible. Foretold years in advance. Verse 41, the, 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 the prophecy continues, Whereas you saw the feet and the toes, partly of clay, partly of iron, the kingdom shall be united. Is that what it says? Divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. Notice this next slide. It says that the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. And friends, I'm going to go back real quickly. If you see here of the statue, notice, don't forget, those, 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 the, the, right after the legs, you have the feet of iron and clay, those two different metals. The Bible says that that last kingdom was going to be partly strong, partly fragile. It would be divided. So as we think in history, all right, who came in and conquered Rome? Well, uh, essentially, friends, no one did. Because Rome was not conquered from without, but divided from within. Again, you can look at this uh, in any history book, friends, but if you look up there on the screen, you will find that there were ten barbaric tribes that they came in and they started dividing Rome. And they spread out and became the various nations of Europe. And friends, those tribes that came in and divided, uh, divided Rome and spread out in the various countries of Europe, that is precisely where we are today. Friends, after the toes, there's no other metal. The toes is the last one. And so essentially, this prophecy is from 476 AD when those tribes begin to spread out and divide Rome up until right now. We are in this prophecy in Scripture because Europe is still divided. Europe is still divided, friends. You have these uh, various tribes, the Alamanis, who were the Germans. You can read that list. In the sake of time, we'll skip through it. But, but these were the tribes that became uh, modern-day divided Europe. And friends, you have, you have the Bible predicting that they will not adhere to one another. You have the feet of iron and clay, and you cannot mix iron and clay. If I took a bucket and put in iron and clay, there's no way that I could get 
choir on, right? Just mixing those two words. It wouldn't be impossible. Iron and clay do not mix together. You can burn them. You can do whatever you want. They don't mix together. And the Bible says that Europe will remain divided. There is nothing that, to unite it. And friends, let me tell you that people throughout history have sure tried. You have Charlemagne that tried to unite Europe. You have Charles V that tried. You have Louis XIV. You have Napoleon. You have Kaiser. You have Hitler. We know the story of Hitler well. That Hitler came in, and he sure tried to make everyone the same. He tried to unite Europe. But friends, every single one of them failed. In fact, even Napoleon. Napoleon, as he, as he came in, he tried to unite Europe. And in fact, it's, it's known that, that uh, actually the story goes that, that, that someone showed him this Bible prophecy. And he said, you know what? He threw the Bible across the room and said, God is too much for me. As he realized, you know what? My efforts are in vain. People have tried to unite Europe, but it hasn't worked. Have you heard of the European Union, friends, beginning in World War II to foster economic cooperation? And that's still going on today. And just recently, in 2016, just a couple years ago, have you seen this picture? Brexit. Stand for, for the, the Britain's exit. The British exit. Brexit. Friends, the reason why this took place is because the Bible predicted it. That Europe will remain divided until Jesus comes. There will be people that will try to unite it, but it won't happen. They will not adhere to one another, the Bible says. And friends, don't forget that that stone that hit the image right at its feet became a great mountain. What does that mountain represent? Friends, verse 44 tells us, In the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Amen? And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. Friends, that stone that hit the feet of that statue. In Nebuchadnezzar's dream, as he sees that stone, and, and that stone crushes the, the image to pieces, and it, and it suddenly fills the whole earth. That mountain, friends, is none other. Is none other than the second coming of Jesus. That is exactly what it is, friends. It's the second coming of Jesus. You can look through history. And friends, as you look at this powerful timeline of history that the Bible gave us, you see that we are living in the, the last part of the prophecy. We're right there on the toes. There's nothing past those, those ten toes, friends. Just like there were ten tribes that came in and divided Rome. There's nothing past those toes. We are in divided Rome right now. The very next event in this prophecy is none other than the second coming of Jesus. When God will come in and set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And friends, that kingdom which shall never be destroyed is an amazing kingdom. Because friends, in that kingdom which shall never be destroyed, there will be no more cancer. Six years ago, my older brother, Daniel, died of brain cancer. But friends, in this kingdom, there's not going to be cancer anymore. As, as, as you think about your lives, I know, friends, that we live in 2019 in, in a country, in a place where there's unrest. And the Bible says, you know what, there's not going to be any more, there's not going to be any more pain in heaven. There's not going to be any more tears in heaven. There's not going to be any more relationship uh, difficulties in heaven. There's not going to be any more divorces in heaven. No. No more, no more, no more. Because, friends, in heaven, the King of kings and the Lord of lords is going to set it up. He's going to set up this kingdom that shall never be destroyed. And, friends, as, as we think about that kingdom... I love what Titus 2 verse 13 says. We look for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That kingdom, friends, is coming soon. That kingdom is coming soon. And the question is tonight, will we 
be ready. The question is tonight, do we want to be there, friends? Because Jesus can get us ready. Because Jesus can prepare us. All we have to do is sit before him and say, Jesus, I want to be there. And I trust not in Jeff Harper to get me there. I don't trust in my pastor to get me there. I don't trust in my mom or dad to get me there. I trust in Jesus to get me there. I trust that the word of God says it's going to happen, that the dream is certain, and the interpretation sure. Friends, simple appeal tonight. Simple appeal. I just want to ask you that if you want to be there in that heavenly kingdom that will never be destroyed, would you just raise your hand? You say, you know what? I trust God's word to get me there. I don't fully understand it. I don't know exactly what it's going to be like, but I want to be there and I want to be in the kingdom that will never be destroyed with Jesus as the king. Jesus has the power to do that, friends. And he can do a miracle in your life. Friends, you don't want to miss tomorrow night's presentation. Tomorrow, Saturday, May 18 at 6.30 p.m., we are going to look at the perfect prophetic proof of Jesus Christ's identity. Friends, have, have you ever seen the Bible pinpoint? We saw some general time periods tonight, but we are going to find out that the Bible predicts with astonishing accuracy something to take place in the future. You do not want to miss it. 6.30 p.m. Don't forget, friends, that at 6.05 We'll be here watching that film. Will you bow your heads in prayer with me? Father, we cannot wait to see you face to face. Lord, as we look at the Word of God, we find out that we can trust the Bible, that you foretold thousands of years in advance what was going to take place. Father, thank you that the Bible is trustworthy and true, and thank you that the God of the Bible is trustworthy and true. We love you, God. We cannot wait to see you and be part of that kingdom that will never be destroyed. We love you, and we pray all of these things in your name. Amen. Amen. We hope you have a great night. Cannot wait to see you tomorrow night. Don't forget, 6.05, if you want to watch part of that film, 6.30, right here. We will be here on your way out. Grab those study guides. And if you fill each of those study guides out night after night, then you will get a special Bible school certificate. And if you come 10 nights in a row, that Andrew's study Bible is yours. Hope you have a great night. God bless.